uh, and for, for this, this evening of uh, fun and information sharing. Um, can, can people hear me at the back? You can hear okay? Good. I was going to say hands up if you can't hear, but that's a bit silly. <laughs> and I'm never silly. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We're really excited to host the biggest ever uh, scleroderma event from Living with Scleroderma. And we have a, a great selection of um, panelists tonight and speakers. Um, I'm Dr. Maggie Larche. I'm a rheumatologist here in Hamilton. And uh, I see many of you across the room who I'm familiar with, so thank you for coming. We also have uh, Maureen Warren Sove, who is the Vice President of the Canadian Society, and her, her role is in advocacy and um, patient affairs. So she's, the, she's our great proponent of advocacy. Yes. Yes, great idea. <laughs> Um, we have Faiza Kokar, who is our rheumatology fellow over at the desk over there, and she's going to talk about what your tests mean to you and uh, how, how they're relevant. The blood tests, all the testing that we do, all the boring testing that we get you to do, the lung function, the echoes and, and blood. And then we also have Andrea Gardner, who is the uh, person who's been completely uh, immersed in this session, trying to organize it, getting this, it's almost like a wedding, isn't it? 115 people here. So thank you, Andrea. She's our uh, patient support um, coordinator, nurse extraordinaire. We have um, Dr. Gerard Cox, who's coming, uh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, he will be here. He's on service today, so he's, uh, he's running a bit late. But he'll be coming to talk about some of the interstitial lung disease elements of scleroderma and how they can affect patients. We also have another respirologist, Dr. Nathan Hambly, who's going to be talking about pulmonary hypertension and how, how that affects patients with scleroderma and what can be done about that. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Nader Khalidi, who's my rheumatology partner in crime. And uh, he's going to be talking about what's going on in research in Hamilton and how you can get involved. So tonight is all about you participating. Uh, I've got a few housekeeping um, elements to talk to you about. The first is the internet. We'd much rather you use the Courtyard Guest, not the Courtyard Conference website if you're linked in with, the, with um, emails and um, your, your um, iPhones. Please help yourselves during the course of the evening. I think until the break there will be food outside, so please help yourselves. I think it certainly smells delicious. There's an evaluation form on the, de on the tables in front of you. Please, please, please fill those in. It really helps us plan for the next year and, and by you filling those in it, it, uh, we, we can generate an even better program next year. There are question cards, those, those uh, very bright cards in the middle of the desks there. there are, those are for you to write down questions during the course of the evening if you, as you think of them and we'd be, we'll try our best to get to those questions at the end of the evening when we do a question and answer session from the tables over there. There are tables outside with the um, Scleroderma Society of Ontario and some information sheets and community resource sheets and so on for you to have a look at out, out there and please take those information sheets because that's why we brought them. Um, I want to thank the SSO for um, partnering with us on this evening and uh, bringing some of the IT and we're live streaming this so friends who can't make it tonight uh, can have a ability to see it live streaming and then of course we'll record it and put it on our website so it, it's for your reference at a later date. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Ask and his team um, who are videoing this and, and that's how we'll get this on the website. Um, and a, a quick plug for uh, a event that Dr. Ask is very involved with called Demystifying Medicine. It's a great program where, where they get um, a patient with a disease, any disease, they get a doctor talking about that disease, and they get a scientist talking about the disease as well, all in, all in, all in one session. 
And these are videoed and they're available online, Demystifying Medicine at the, at, from the McMaster website. It's a great resource and actually through his students and talking about scleroderma, we've got many students developing little um, infomercials about these about the disease and uh, really helpful. So thank you. Quick plug there. And last plug, um, I want to plug the Paris to Ancaster bike ride. I don't know if anybody, if any of you know about it, but it's a phenomenal uh, bike ra race that we've become involved with. This is a, we've done it for the second year this year. It's held in April, unfortunately, um, and unfortunately April because it's so cold or potentially so cold. But this year we raised eighteen thousand dollars for scleroderma, and uh, thank you. Those funds are going to be used in Hamilton to help support you guys and help drive research forward. And that's why we're raising this money. So any of you who feel like joining in next year, there's a twenty-kilometer, a forty-kilometer, and John will attest to the seventy-kilometer bike ride. And um, you can choose any of them, and they're really good fun. It's a great, uh, great thing to get involved with. So, without further ado, I'm going to get on with um, partnering with Maureen, and we're going to talk about um, some of your annoying symptoms. And the idea of this talk is to talk to you about some of the symptoms that patients with scleroderma get, and then have Maureen's perspective on. Okay, so this is what the doctor tells me, but what, what's the best thing to do from a patient perspective and how do we get around these issues? And that's what we're going to do today. So I'm just going to pick on a few, or we're pick, picking on a few of the annoying symptoms of scleroderma. I'm going to pick on Raynaud's digital or finger and toe ulcers, um, GERD, it's called GERD, or acid reflux. Um, we'll touch upon bloating and other GI symptoms, stomach symptoms, and then shortness of breath and swollen ankles and what to do about them. So um, just in brief, because we'll talk about this in each of the individual annoying symptoms categories, but in brief, what can you do to help yourself? Well, you can be informed, and thank you for coming tonight, because this really helps you be informed. You can participate in research, and Dr. Khalidi is going to talk about how you can participate in research in, in Hamilton and beyond. Um, get your friends and family involved, and again, that's why we're hosting this evening, is to allow your family and friends to help you, support you through this disease. Try to take advice from us, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, Think about some self-help strategies. What can you do? How can you change your diet? Um, how can you help your GERD and what happens with your Raynaud's? So we'll talk about that in a second. So what is Raynaud's? Up to 10% of women get Raynaud's. It's cold, white fingers. Um, other, other people who get Raynaud's are people who use big, heavy, vibrating tools. So those people who clean the floors in a hospital and their, their big machine vibrates or jackhammer uh, people. Raynaud's, he, he, he was a Frenchman who describes two or three color changes, either red, white, blue or, or a combination of each. And I suppose it's apt because he's French and red, white and blue is the color of their flag. <laughs> um, and it's because, that Raynaud's happens because your blood vessels cramp down and that's a normal reaction to cold. That's what I would do if I went to the Arctic and I forgot my gloves. My, my peripheral blood supply would shut down and it cramps down. And that's to protect my heart and lungs and kidneys, right? That's a normal reaction. What happens in pa patients with Raynaud's is that happens way too quickly. In a, in, a, in a room that you just walk in and there's a little bit of air conditioning on, your blood vessels clamp down, and that's what happens in Raynaud's, uh, which is pathological. So it's a, it's, a, it's a normal response, but to an abnormal trigger. So that's what Raynaud's is. And Raynaud's can be primary, and most people with Raynaud's have primary Raynaud's. And primary Raynaud's means that there's no um, <coughs> disease associated with it. Secondary Raynaud's is what patients with scleroderma get. They get it because of their disease, scleroderma, because there's an abnormality in their blood vessels. And these are the typical bi or triphasic color changes that, that I can see some nods around the room. Okay. What can you do to help yourself next? Um, over to Maureen. 
Okay, so the list here is absolutely everything that our doctors recommend. Smoking cessation, avoid the cold, um, moisturizers, you can read it, I don't need to, I suppose. Avoiding the cold when you live in Canada is next to impossible. Um, so from my end, um, it's very much about avoiding touching cold. Um, holding a cold glass in the middle of the summer is, is going to be problematic. Um, cleaning out your freezer or your fridge. These are things that absolutely would require some sort of protection for your hands. A, a glove. Uh, with glasses, I use these insulated cups that have an air pocket between, whether they're plastic or glass. It just keeps the glass from sweating and keeps the um, hot or cold away from my hands. Um, heated gloves. Um, everybody talks about covering your hands and covering uh, and, and then socks. The gloves are great, um, but we go into vasospasm not only because we're cold, but what happens in the body's natural thing is when we sweat, we let off a little moisture, we get a little breeze, and we get the reaction. So layers, tank tops with sweaters and jackets and scarves. I always carry a scarf on my purse because especially in the summer, you go, well, you don't need it in the summer. Well, you do in a grocery store. Um, and instead of putting a hat and mitts on, I just put a scarf around my neck, and that seems to be enough. In the same way that cooling your neck when you're overly heated um, calms your body temperature. Um, socks. Uh, I travel like an old lady with socks to everybody's house. Um, and I'm okay with that, because if I keep my feet warm, then chances are very good that the rest of me stays warm. Mm -hmm. So I'm more concerned about protecting my core body temperature and my feet than I am specifically just about the hands. The other thing not to forget is stress. I had the perfect example of this once upon a time. I was at the top of the CN Tower, not afraid of heights. But I'll tell you, the second I stepped on that glass platform, I felt the blood flow um, leave my hands and feet. And I looked down and instantly they went wild. Like I, I could watch it happening. So that stress reaction, so high stress in our lives, families take note, um, high stress in our lives is, is something we do have to try and control. And it's hard enough when you can't do what you think you should be able to do without people putting pressure on you to do things that are uncomfortable. So that's a great way for family to help us to realize that stress is really, really bad. Great. Thank you. So what about medications? What can we do for Raynaud's? The first line are, are things that most of you will have heard of. Amlodipine, nifedipine, diltiazem. These are all drugs called calcium channel blockers, and they work to open up the blood supply. And there are three good reasons that everyone should be on those medications. Um, nitrate patches are something that we also use. They're, they were designed for patients with angina. And you could think about Raynaud's being angina of your fingers. Angina is blood supply closing off to your heart. And uh, Raynaud's is blood supply closing off to your fingers. So um, nitrate patches are nitro -dure and, and patches like that. We also use nitrate um, ointment in between the finger web spaces that can be used. And then angiotensin receptor blockers like Losartan can be used. And then if those don't work well enough, then we add, uh, we, we try to add drugs like Viagra, Cialis. So don't be surprised if I come to you one day and I say, hey, I want to prescribe you some Viagra. And you're thinking, well, Larsha, you've gone crazy. Well, I haven't really gone crazy. And uh, these, are, these are great drugs that open up the blood supply like they're designed to do for their original purpose. Um, uh, Maureen may want to say something about um, advocacy regarding those drugs because actually they're very, very difficult to get hold of for our patients with Raynaud's or digital ulcers. So um, do you want to sure. say a couple? Okay. Uh, we're on the front end right now of trying to uh, convince our government to cover sildenafil or uh, um, Cialis, or the sildenafil is Viagra, um, Viagra or Cialis, the other way around, um, because we believe that there's um, science that shows that it's really uh, a logical next step before you're into some very heavy treatments. Um, right now, unfortunately, um, that's not covered by the Ontario Public Drug Plan. And it's not covered because when Pfizer introduced the drug, they started off, uh, if I believe the story, you can correct me, Maggie, um, 
It was designed as a vasodilator for people like us. It wasn't designed as an erectile dysfunction drug. It had this happy side effect. Um, and so <laughs> Pfizer certainly ran with that and did all their studies, safety studies in that area. Um, they then came back to the cardiac portion of the program or the vasodilator part of the program and did that. They never listed this as a, a an indication for digital ulcers and severe raynodes. So because it's not listed, um, the government won't fund it. So we're desperately going to be looking for your help uh, in the coming months and year or two that it'll take to convince them because we believe it's really important that you have access to it. Now if you've got a great drug plan, you'll probably be covered. Um, if you don't have a great drug plan, they can be very expensive. Thank you. The next. Um, just go back one. Next steps are bringing you into hospital for um, intravenous drugs like alprostadil. Um, and those can be either now in the outpatient, Dr. Khalidi has worked for two and a half years to get it available as an outpatient now, five days in a row, or um, on, uh, on, as an inpatient on the car coronary care unit. Um, and then there are other options as well. So I'm going to move on. So what about digital um, ulcers? Up to 50% of patients get ulcers on their fingertips or toes or knuckles and it's a huge cause of suffering so I thought this would be an important annoying symptom to discuss. Yeah. What about self-help? Well really it's, uh, it's very similar to the last, the last bit. Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I, the biggest thing that I can say is that most of the time when an ulcer is beginning to form, you'll notice a dry patch, you'll notice a, an inconsistency in the skin. At that point, using something, I don't like um, lotions so much, I find my skin's too thick for them to absorb well, but I do like oils like the vitamin E oil or bio, uh, bio oil. Uh, and there's two advantages to using those when you put them on. If you massage your hands and, or, and your feet, if you're pushing this in, and you do that just while you're watching television or doing something else, there's two benefits. While you're massaging, you're getting blood flowing, and the oils will help to moisturize. Um, there are some of us who believe that doing that appropriately all the time should help to minimize. The other thing to understand is that, uh, and I don't know if Maggie can correct this or not, uh, but calcinosis is often uh, part of the problem with digital ulcers, and it is extremely painful. So making sure that you, when, when they start and you're having problems, you want to be in touch with your specialist to, before it gets out of hand. You're certainly watching for infection because that can go very quickly. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention about digital ulcers is, I, especially for relatives who are in the room, Think about the time you've had a paper cut on your finger, on your index finger, paper cut. It's really horrible, isn't it? And it lasts for a day or two, and then it heals. Patients with digital ulcers with scleroderma last for months, months. And you can't type, you can't write, you can't do the functions that, that, that you would want to. So, so just, it looks like a little ulcer on your fingertip. Have a bit of empathy is what I'm trying to say. Wound care, I'm going to move on. So again, treatment of digital ulcers is actually almost identical tr to treatment of uh, Raynaud's, so we'll move on. What about um, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease? You get symptoms of acid, next uh, click. Symptoms of acid burning in the back of your throat or pain in your stomach, sometimes a bit of bloating, that horrible, that horrible feeling. And it's likely caused by fibrosis in scleroderma of the lower esophageal sphincter, which um, you can see depicted here. This is this band of tissue that's supposed to close off your stomach from your esophagus. So it's supposed to sit there nice and tight. And actually in scleroderma that gets opened up. So therefore your acid from your stomach can whip up into your esophagus. And um, there are lots of self-help things that we can do here. Okay, raising the head of your bed. Um, I remember listening to a couple of other doctors when we've been to some international um, forums and they say, if there's one thing you can do to help yourself, it's raise the head of your bed. So for many people, that's, they'll tell me they'll put bricks under the headboard to lift the bed just that little bit. 
Um, I find that that isn't necessarily comfortable for my husband. So you can um, certainly put a pillow between the box spring and mattress on your side of the bed. Uh, the advantage of that is you're not going to knock it out in the middle of the night. It's going to stay there and just keep you that little bit elevated. Um, uh, trying not to eat within four hours of going to sleep, that's challenging for me. <laughs> uh, I'd say be careful with what you eat. Probably the biggest thing is, is understanding what you're eating and how challenging it is for your body to digest. Um, there are foods that are really easy to digest. If your reflux is acting up, soups, stews, um, these things are already partially broken down in the cooking process. You've maintained the nutrients. They're just easier for your body to process. So you don't want to be, uh, for me, I would never eat fresh fruit and vegetables just before going to bed. I know that my stomach's going to be trying to absorb them for a long time, particularly if you're taking Nexium or anything like that, the proton pump inhibitors, because you have less acid in your stomach to break them down. It's going to sit there for a long time. So eating things that are easy for your body to digest, ironically, are also easy to swallow. And, and swallowing can be problematic at different stages with the illness. Um, Cut coffee and tea, well, and you can cut my right arm at the same time. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am a Tim's franchisee. Um, but, but that aside, um, I don't sleep well, and I know many of you probably have difficulty sleeping. Um, so in order for me to get through my day, I mean, I start the mornings like Helen Keller. I really am sort of deaf, dumb, and not so bright. Um, so I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to listen to anybody until I have a cup of coffee. Now, I wouldn't have coffee before going to bed. I, I mitigate it through the day with uh, herbal teas um, that are non-problematic. Uh, and if you go to David's teas, there's some great ones that are actually good for digestion. Um, experiment to find what works for you. Because um, I don't like not having a hot drink. Um, drinking water is great. I don't drink pop normally. Juices are too acidic. So, like I said, watching what you're putting in your mouth, if you're having problems with your reflux. The other thing to consider, you can look at things, um, insoluble versus soluble fibers. And, and I'm just going to say that because it's too big a conversation and there's not enough time. But if you were to Google that and take a look at the kinds of foods that are easy to digest, that will really give you a great guideline. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll also tell you if you're having trouble with lower GI, um, either stuff sitting in the GI for too long, um, whether it's uh, constipation or diarrhea, modifying the type of foods that you eat will certainly help with those symptoms as well. And then medications, we can use lots of medications. We often use proton pump inhibitors at, at high doses, almost double doses, um, to help with some of the GI side effects. Um, and uh, sometimes we can add in another drug called ranitidine in addition. Okay. So what about shortness of breath? I'm not going to dwell on this because Dr. Hambly and Cox are going to really focus on the, sh the, the lung issues of scleroderma. Um, there are many causes of being short of breath. One is that you're less fit. You're, you're, you're not doing as much as you used to do, so your, your fitness level drops. So maybe that's why you're short of breath. Maybe you're anemic. Maybe you've got lung or heart problems. So these are all things that I think about when I'm seeing a patient who's telling me they're short of breath. And I've underlined you should always seek medical attention if you suddenly become short of breath because there are life-threatening disasters that could be happening to you if you suddenly get short of breath. So Definitely seek medical attention. And um, treatment, self-help. You know, try to stay fit and active. I remember when I was first sick, um, it was enough to get dressed and showered in the morning, never mind go to a gym. Um, but I did start working out with a, 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 an RMT that I knew, a registered massage therapist who was also a personal trainer. And he taught me some Pilates exercises that I could do that helped with my range of motion. And, and the range of motion, I think, is really key. Um, I ended up being more fit. I fet, felt healthier. Um, I continue to see him today. And when I'm too busy, I give it up. And I really, really notice the difference if I haven't been to see him in a, in a couple months. So I think staying physically fit, for not just for any shortness of breath, but for everything else that goes with this illness is, is really, really important. Um, Compression stockings, raising your feet, making sure you get your feet up. I mean, these are things you already know. Um, shortness of breath, and it would be more to family members, just be patient. 
uh, can't run the six minute mile anymore. Doesn't mean we can't do the mile. It's just not going to be in six minutes. <laughs> so, and the six minute walk test, each of us at different points in our illness will get different distances. So we just have to be patient with ourselves and have our family members and others support us as, as they know we're doing the best we can. Thank you. Um, and the medical treatment depends on the cause, of course, so uh, I'm not going to dwell on that because our lovely re respirologists are coming. Um, so this is really just a summary of some of the things that you can try to do um, uh, with some of the caveats that Maureen alluded to, like avoiding coffee and tea. Hey, most of us can't do that. Um, the other thing I really want to label or, or um, highlight is having your, having your tests done. Please have your tests done. We, we don't order them just because we like ordering tests. We, we order them because we want to know how your lung function is and how your echo's looking year by year by year and whether there's a change in that. And um, uh, talk to us, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much to everyone and um, we'll, be at, we'll be answering questions at the end if, if anyone wants to write them down then we'll be delighted to answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.